Dr. Minkoff, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you, Ben. Good to be here. Yeah, good to have you here. I've been I've been a big admirer of your work for many many years, and uh, Dr. Pampa, who's a friend of yours, he's my mentor, brought you on a couple months ago for a training session with our group, and it was just so valuable. And I'm so glad we set this up. And my audience is going to learn so much about protein, but the right protein and the importance of that. And you're going to debunk a lot of myths. So I can't wait. But let's talk about your story. You've got such a unique story. Okay. And I'd love for you to share how you even became infatuated with finding the perfect protein. So I did uh, my, my medical training is traditional. You know, I did, I did regular medical school and I did a residency in pediatrics and a fellowship in infectious disease. And I was involved with uh, research in antiviral drugs and I was doing consultations at three hospitals for adult and pediatric infections. And um, I made a career switch because I liked acute care and I switched and became an emergency medicine doctor. And I did that for about 15 years. And my, my wife got ill uh, after she had her mercury fillings removed. This mm. is back in 1995. Mm. And uh, the I, nobody knew anything about mercury then. Nobody was talking about mercury then. And she had gone to a seminar and heard that it was bad and went to a dentist and had them drilled out. And um, and then afterwards got a series of sort of autoimmune diseases, you know, her thyroid, her liver, her nervous system. And um, the the guys, I was, I was working in a, in a big hospital and I knew all the good neurologists and endocrinologists. Um, and liver specialists and nobody had any answers except they thought that steroids would be a good idea for her and she should go on interferon and like big time drugs and now she's a triathlete she's she you know she's a podium triathlete so for her age group she's always been you know first second or third and um it didn't make any sense to me and she's a nurse and by accident she um a guy moved in to the same complex that her nursing business, she a, has a home health nurse, um, who on his marquee, it said natural dentistry. And one day I went to pick her up in sort of the middle of all this. And she said, uh, uh, and he was walking out to his car and he's, I just introduced myself to him and I asked him what was natural dentistry? Cause that was a new term for me. And he said, well, oddly enough, we believe that the mouth is actually part of the body and you would not do anything in the mouth that you do that you wouldn't do in the rest of the body like you'd never put mercury in a wound because mm. it's poisonous yeah. very poisonous and you'd never lead no no surgeon would leave in a dead piece of bowel mm. or would leave in a gangrenous toe you have to cut it off because there's no blood supply, there's infection, there's bacteria in there, and they will kill the person. But yeah. 25 million times a year, root canals are done. And he said, so that's the difference between us and them. And then I, I asked him, like, this is my wife's story. And he said, oh, she's mercury toxic. And he said, no one around here is going to help you. You're going to have to learn how to do this. And there's a guy in Seattle, and he he teaches doctors. And so I went out there and I learned, I learned from him. And then from that, I sort of transitioned. Out. So it became so interesting. Yeah. She got better. And then friends started to call me and say, I've got chronic migraine headaches. Will you help me? And I've got rheumatoid arthritis. Will you help me? And so I sort of on the side, aside from the emergency room, it's shift work. So, you know, it was either, I was either working seven in the morning till seven at night or seven at night till seven in the morning. And we would, mm. you know, 14 or 15 days a month, I had my schedule and I had some days where I was free and she had a little extra office in her nursing practice. And I said, why don't you just meet me there at two o'clock on Thursday afternoon? I'm off and I'll, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm not going to charge you, but I'll, I'll, you know, we can play. And it just mushroomed into a practice, you know, next, you know, within a few months I was getting called all the time. The emergency room had turned into a pain clinic. And, um, and so I, I started the practice and then, um, part of the mercury detox program, the guy that I learned it from, you had to take 14 different supplements and it was just unwieldy. And so I thought, well, maybe I could put some of these together 
so that you could simplify it and actually have a program that people could do. And so I put together a multivitamin, which had a lot of this stuff in it. And it was only two tablets twice a day. It was in a, a base of 16 whole organic fruits and vegetables and added extra C, CoQ10, K2, uh, methylfolate. And so it was really, you know, it substituted for like five or six things. Mm -hmm. And um, so we started to make it. And then I, when we first started doing chelation for mercury, we were using DMPS, which is a pharmaceutical chelator. And I got trained in chelation, but I found that too many patients would walk out of the IV room holding their kidneys, mm. you know, and I thought there must be a better way to do this. And I've met a kind of a crazy um, biochemist, um, savant, and we play, started playing with different things and came up with this product, which we called Metal Free. And so then we started a company, which was called Body Health and where we, we had these products. And then my hobby since 1982 was, was Ironman triathlons. So I'm training a lot and I was always interested in performance. And um, I injured my hamstring and I could not get it to heal. Like I massaged it and injected it and pulsed magnetic fielded it, you know, like I did everything, but the soreness remained and I couldn't figure it out. And it was really bothering me because this was something that was uh, like, it was important to me. Uh, every time I would go to the track and I would try to push it, I could feel it was weak and I could feel there was some pain there. And I was worried that I'd really tear it. Um, and then I ran into a guy who had been in Europe and he had an amino acid mixture and he said, why don't you try these? And I tried those and in six weeks, my leg was like normal. Wow. And three months later I went and did, um, Ironman Canada and I had my best time ever. Wow. So I started playing with amino acid mixtures and then I wrote an article for triathlete magazine on my experience. And I got 3,000 people sent me letters of, I want this. Mm -hmm. So we started to manufacture it. And um, I've learned since that, you know, there people don't have a protein deficiency. There is no actual requirement for protein. There is an amino acid requirement because amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. And, uh, so if you supply the necessary amino acids to the body in the right amounts and in the right proportions, then you satisfy the body's needs. And so it, it sort of led to a lot of experimentation with lots of different people, like measuring amino acid levels in actually thousands of people and finding that m most people were their serum fasting essential amino acids were low. Mm. And then I worked with, I had a friend um, uh, who was the the go-to guy for the uh, Lance Armstrong professional cycling team. And I got involved with one, a couple of their riders uh, because some of them got sick and they weren't recovering fast enough. And I started them on amino acids. And uh, one of the guys was George Hincapie, who's he was like the lieutenant for Lawrence Armstrong. You know, he'd done 23 tours or something like that. And he was just an incredible athlete. And he just thought this product was like unbelievable. <laughs> and they started to use it. And the next year, the tour banned uh, amino acid supplements because they, what they found was something that, that nobody didn't ever knew, you know, on a, on a tour, the demands are so high that even though they had professional dietitians and chefs and they were feeding these guys you know as good as they could they all broke down over the over the course of the 23 days of the tour no matter what they did and when they took perfect amino they didn't break down they actually got stronger wow and uh that it was a it was a it was a way that the body could actually keep up with this incredible demand um and and get stronger from the effort rather than get weaker or break down and their, you know, their chronic sore knees and arth you know, their, the arthritis that they would suffer from, you know, by the end, because everybody's exhausted, it didn't, it didn't happen. So that was, so, so 
that was kind of neat. So that's sort of the, you know, that's how I got, I got into it and I, I can keep going like in our practice. So in our practice, we, I've done amino acid levels on probably tens of thousands of people. Mm. We do it on everybody and almost everybody's low mm. and they're low because they have bad gut. You know, yeah. they're taking, they're taking acid blockers of one sort or another, many people, and they have no stomach acid and they're, they're amino acid malnourished and they don't make digestive enzymes and their guts are all overgrown with candida and parasites and other stuff. And they don't absorb, they don't digest, they don't absorb. And so this amino acids was sort of a, a very easy way to sort of bypass the whole thing. Yeah. They're, you know, they're absorbed. And in, in, if you measure the blood in 23 minutes, they're in your bloodstream and they go right to the cells and then you can fix everything. So that's the idea. Yeah. That's amazing. We're going to dive deep into that. And your story and your wife's story is incredible too. Cause you're right back in 1995, there was not really a lot of biological dentistry and these holistic dentists. And most people, I mean, Dr. Pompa included, he got really sick after he had his fillings removed the wrong way. Yep. You get the, you know, you just absorb all this mercury. Um, so number one, if you have silver fillings, for sure, you want to get them out from a biological dentist. Um, we usually send people to IAOMT.org. Yep. And, then the, and then the root canal thing, you were, you were in the movie Root Cause, correct? Well, I'm the reason for the movie. You're the reason for the, the movie. backstory on the movie was was a on a Friday afternoon at closing time, a guy from Australia called our switchboard and told the the receptionist that he needed to talk to me. It was a semi emergency that I had saved his life and it was really important. And so she calls it. I'm sitting in my office now. She called into my office and it's like five o'clock and I had somewhere I had to go. And she said, I got this guy on the phone. He sounds a little kooky, but he said, you saved his life. Do you want to talk to him? And I said, sure. So I picked up the phone and he said, you don't know me, but I want to tell you a brief story of what happened. He said, I was walking through a park one day and uh, I saw a guy and his girlfriend having an argument and the guy throws his girlfriend onto the ground. And I, I walked over as sort of good Samaritan and said, hey guys, you know, chill out. And the boyfriend turned around and he saw me and he punched me in the face and he broke off my front tooth. He went to the dentist. He uh, got a root canal and over six or eight months, he started to feel more and more fatigued, more brain foggy, felt really bad. Went to 13 or 14 different practitioners, including a shaman and a faith healer because he was desperate. And nobody had any answers for him. And he ended up where he couldn't work. He was at home in bed. Now his profession was documentary film producer. He was 28 years old. And he ended up in bed. And he said, one day in bed, I was surfing through YouTube. And he said, I saw your video that you made on root canals. Wow. And I had learned this from Thomas Rao. He's a physician from Switzerland. And in like 1998 or 1999, he came over to the U.S. every quarter for a week. And he did a course in European biological medicine. There's probably 25 of us in the course. And he had this big emphasis on no healthy teeth, no healthy body. Mm. And so I learned about root canals and I started looking for root canals in people who had chronic illness in their practice. And lo and behold, it was like a like like when they had root canals and they were chronically ill, if you took out the root canals and you fixed up their nutrition and detoxification, and the other stuff, they would get better. And these were people who weren't getting better. So he said, I saw that video that you made. And I said to myself, no one's thought of that. So he goes to a dentist, he gets this specialized C a CT scan, cone beam CT scan. Yep. And he's got a root canal and an abscess. Mm. And the dentist pulls the tooth, cleans up the abscess, and in four or five months, he's back to normal. He said, I'm calling you because I feel good now. And I want to do a documentary on this because nobody knows this. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that this has ever happened to. And can I bring a film crew over from the from Australia and film this? And I said, sure. And that's the that's that's how the film got started. So he came here and he did me. 
and he did Mercola and he did a couple of other, Stuart Nunnally, you know, a couple of other guys. And the film went viral on yeah. Netflix. Yeah. We got 300 calls from people around the country who saw the film, who wanted to come and see us. And I mean, we can't handle that kind of volume. Uh, and so then I got a call from the, the guy who made the film and he said, it's being pulled down on Netflix. And he sent me the letter because the American Dental Association's attorneys were getting so much pushback from patients. Wow. That they sent a threat letter to Netflix saying, if you don't take this down, because everything you're presenting in this film is lies and, you know, and not true, that we're going to sue you. And so Netflix took the film down. And uh, people can watch the film. It's called rootcausemovie.com. You can watch it on on um, uh, Gaia and some and and the the producer has his own website. Yep. Um, but it's um, it's that that's where that that's where that thing came from. It's it's uh, pretty crazy. It's crazy. I, I've I've seen that film. It was really well done. And you're right. He went to like 13 or 14 different practitioners and it kind of starts off that well that way in a funny way and then he gets to the reason why which is the the root canal and uh, i remember when it got pulled off of netflix because it was very controversial so it's still available um i i believe his website is rootcausemovie.com and gaia has it i sent everybody there who has a root canal so they could really understand yeah. you said he had an apps an abscess apps sense uh, abscess excuse abscess. Me. is that the same thing as a cavitation or is that different or did he also have a cavitation no, it's it's different. Okay. So a cavitation, if you have a wisdom tooth pulled and the bone doesn't heal back in so that it's solid jaw bone, then you are left with a cavity there that the the density of the bone is very low. Like if you do one of these cone beam x-rays, the, the CT scan gives you a bone density. So normal bone density on the CT scan is zero. If there's a hole there, it starts going into minus levels of bone. And I saw somebody this morning had a minus 990. Mm. There's a big open hole there. And in the open hole, the body puts biotoxins. You get infections in there. And these, these areas can be chronic sources of toxin for these people. Yeah. And then if you're thinking sort of acupuncture wise, the wisdom teeth, which is usually where these cavitations are, they're on small intestine heart meridian. They also affect the brain. And so some people with arrhythmias, if you fix their cavitation, their arrhythmias go away. They don't mm -hmm. need to, you know, they don't need drugs to block their arrhythmia. They, they, the, the source is their teeth. Uh, but the, the, the root canal. So what happens is that the, the person goes to the dentist because the cavity broke through the enamel part of the tooth. So the enamel is this hard plate and underneath the enamel is the pulp of the tooth. So it's an open, it's an area where the blood vessels are and where the nerves are. And a tooth is a, is an organ. It's like a lung. Each tooth is like a lung or a brain or a heart. It's a separate organ. It's got a blood supply and it's got a nerve supply. And so in the pulp of the tooth is where the nerves are. And if the cavity breaks through the enamel and gets into the pulp, then the nerve gets inflamed because there's an infection in there yeah. and it hurts. So the person goes to the dentist, like I got a bad toothache. The dentist then has really two choices. The, the blood supply to a root canal is not good enough that you could say, okay, take this antibiotic or take silver or take this, you know, grapefruit seed extract or some other sort of thing to try to kill the infection because the blood supply isn't good enough and it won't work. And not many people will put up with a toothache that's bad too long. So the dentist has a choice. He can either pull a tooth and it ends the problem or what they do with a root canal is they drill through, the drill kills the nerve, it kills the blood supply, they pack it with this stuff called gutta perch. It's sort of a cement. They usually put a metal kind of post in there because when you drill out the tooth, it's not as thick and it could be weak. So you have like cement with a rebar and then they put a cap on top of it and that's a root canal. Now the infection's still there. 
And now you have a dead tooth because there's no blood supply. Mm. And a tooth has these little canals, you know, so the blood supply is in the middle, but but teeth are living bone. So there's bone cells, there's osteocytes at the edge that are manufacturing this bone. And the way they get the nutrition from the blood vessels, which are in the middle, is these little teeny canals. And these are, they're called dentin tubules. Now in a molar tooth, if you added the dentin tubules like end to end, it would be a couple miles. So in a tooth, wow. there's millions of them. Wow. And, they're, and the bacteria go in there and they grow. Yeah. There are photographs of this. You can see it where you take a big blown up, um, uh, you know, uh, a microscopic of it. And you can see the bacteria are living in these holes. They're not dead. And they produce biotoxins, very potent biotoxins, which leak into the body. And then they poison the person. If you want to see something interesting, I just got this. This is, so this is a lab. It's called DNA Connections. And they, the dentist that did this, when he pulled the root canal, so 100% of root canals are infected. 100%. 100%. You hear 100%. that? Okay. And I'll read you a thing, which, which this was actually studied. But before I do it, let me just finish this. So he pulled the tooth. He took a little scraping at the base of the tooth where it was in the jawbone. And he sent it to DNA Connections for analysis. Now, these are probably 20 different bacteria. You can't read it. All toxic bacteria. The black line shouldn't be there. If there was no infection, the black line wouldn't be there. This infection is massive. Wow. And these are all like, I, I was an infectious disease doctor. So these are bad bugs. Staph aureus, Streptococcus, um, Fusobacterium, Enterobacter, Endamoeba species. So there's parasites in there. There's Campylobacter, Actinomyces. There's funguses in there. This is in the base of this tooth. It's wild. So this isn't healthy. So anyway, that's the, so there's two things, you know, the two big things in the mouth, the three big things. It's there, there can be mercury in the mouth and there can be root canals and there can be these cavitations. Mm. And most people in, in one of the statistics, it's interesting. We, we see a lot of cancer patients in our clinic. Mm -hmm. And um, at least 90% of the breast cancer patients that we see, which is probably about 40% of the patients that we're seeing are breast cancer patients, have root canals on the stomach teeth. These are the molar teeth on the bottom and the premolar teeth on the uh, our molar teeth on the top and the premolar teeth on the bottom. They have root canals on those. Crazy. And <laughs> it's not an accident. Yeah. And I'm not saying every root canal causes cancer. It doesn't. But breast cancer is very common. It's a devastating disease. And if you got root canals, I wouldn't keep them in. Mm -hmm. uh, Agreed. Yeah, that's why you got to find a good biological dentist and get that 3D cone beam scan done. Yeah. Uh, and, but not only that, I mean, you could probably add to this, but you, the person needs to know how to read the 3D cone beam scan. It's not a regular scan, so they have to be trained on that. So you, some biological dentists might have the machine, but they're not necessarily trained on that, right? That's absolutely true. Because these scanners are used by all the people who do implants. Because if you're going to put an implant in, you have to have a three-dimensional, that, that, that implant has to be oriented in three dimensions correctly. And on a two, you know, on a, on a, on a two dimensional x-ray, you can't see it. So they have them, but these dentists are taught to, to not read the pathology that's in the mouth. The dentists, my, this is my sort of what I've learned from this is that the dentist, the average dentist, if you're not complaining and it looks good, they're not going to make any issue of it. Mm, they leave it alone. They just leave it alone. So how does a, how does a person, what are the right questions to ask that biological dentist to make sure they know how to read a 3d cone beam scan? Well, I think if here's the first one, if they're a member of IAOMT and there's a couple other dental biological, uh, uh, organizations, that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. Some of these guys might also be doing root canals. Mm. And if they are, you don't want them for your dentist mm -hmm. good because tip. they don't yeah. believe it. Yep. You no. Know? There was guys here in town who were doing mercury removal, but then they were also doing, they were also putting mercury in the other room. It's crazy. And if the guy isn't, 
if, he, if he's not a believer, you don't want him for your dentist. Yeah. You know, it's like walking into a doctor's office and he's 50 pounds overweight and he's got nicotine on his breath. Walk out yeah. because if your guy's not living it, he's not who you want. He might be the totally. smartest guy in the world, but he's it's a BSer. Yeah, I, that reminds me when I was in college, my my nutrition professor was obese, and she brought McDonald's into class every every class. It's like, right? How are you? It's like it's, it's consciously and subconsciously, it's like, how, should I listen to this person? The answer is no. So yeah, that's good. Know. Yeah, we had a guy here in Clearwater who who was removing mercury, and and so the patient would come to me when they were sicker after the mercury was removed. I hadn't sent him to this dentist, but he was a popular dentist. And so what we discovered is that he really didn't believe it. So he would take off some of the mercury, but leave some of it there. Wow. And then crown it. Now you've got mercury. So mercury boils at 110 degrees. A cup of coffee is 150 to 180. So you have a crown sandwiching mercury in a tooth and you eat some hot soup or some coffee or you're chewing mm -hmm. and that mercury boils it can't come out it's going in mm -hmm. and on some of these people you'll see if you look at the gum you'll see a tattoo it's actually a mercury tattoo it's gray and the gum the mercury came out the tooth and the gum is now gray and it's mercury and this guy was getting sicker and sicker and finally it dawned on me i i took a thermometer with that had a mercury bulb on it because i couldn't figure out what was going on because the, the teeth didn't look like there was any mercury left and i put the thermometer next to the tooth and i muscle tested and i could tell there was mercury underneath that crown and i sent him to another dentist a dentist that i knew and that i trusted and we pulled the crown off there was mercury on all these and Jeez. that's why he was sick and when he got it cleaned up yeah he did the mercury detox on him he was he was fine yeah, that's wild. And and you said something really important and then did the mercury detox, meaning first step, get them removed safely. Second step, you got to detox it out of the brain, out of your tissues and organs the right way. Yeah. Uh, so there's a two prong approach there. Do you have a, a dentist that you recommend in the, in the temp area that you work with? We got three good guys in town. Um, I mostly work with one because he's three blocks from me. But um, but there's two other guys who are who are well trained and they do a really good job and they're all busy. They're all booked out months ahead of time. Can you share any of their names just in case somebody lives in that area? Uh, Luis Alicia, A-L-I-C-I-A. -I um, he's over on West Shore, um, which is sort of uh, West Tampa. Mm -hmm. um, the one I use all the time is Paul Rodeguero. I love him. He's terrific. I use him as my personal dentist. Awesome. Um, and... Uh, Give me a second and I'll, I'll give you the yeah, other. Yeah, and I'll share, I'll share mine. I have one in Miami that I that's really good. His name is Dr. Theodore Herman. Um, so if you're in South Miami, he's down Ted there. Herman, yes. And I've sent people to Ted Herman. He's great. Oh, you know Ted. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah he's he's my dentist. He's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, so though, there you go. And then, if you know, if you don't live in Florida, you could either fly to Florida or go to IAOMT.org and, you know, find somebody. Don't go to a regular dentist. Would you agree that it's better to keep the fillings in your mouth versus getting them removed from the uh, dentist that's not biological? I would. Yeah. I would. Yeah, don't get them removed the wrong way. Yeah. Get them removed. There's, there's enough guys around and it's, it, you know, it might at the most be a two or three day procedure where you could do, you know, you could do one quadrant and even if you have to travel a couple of hours, you know, get somebody good, they do it, you go home, you reschedule in a few weeks to get the next one done. So it's not a, it's, it's, you know, it's not like you're going to have to keep seeing this dentist because it's a sort of one and done. Type Correct. Of procedure. Yeah. And it also depends on how many, how many you have. If you just have a couple on the same con quadrant, it could just be one session versus like multiple. I had eight of them. Uh, so I had two sessions, four and four. Yeah. And then, of course, did the, the mercury detox with Dr. Pompa. But I had eight of them for 20 plus years. They were all pretty small, but they were doing a number on my health. And I was doing everything perfectly, uh, Doc. I was doing keto, keto flexing, going in and out, CrossFit, intermittent fasting, and it was just like, I still was fatigued. I still had brain fog and digestive issues, and that was the missing piece right there, getting the source removed. Thank thankfully, I, I did a 3D cone beam scan, and there was no cavitations, never had a root canal, but yeah. it was the mercury that was doing damage to me. Yeah. If you want to hear, a, I, I don't know if we have time, but there's a, a sort of interesting story is I had a woman come in, and she would... She owned a cosmetic studio. It was a very successful cosmetic studio in the super high end area here. 
Um, and she came in, her story was that she, she was in her early fifties and she'd had 25 years of terrible headaches and she was taking 20 Tylenol every day to get through the day. Oh my gosh. Because nobody could figure out what was wrong with her headaches or, you that know, what was liver. the her headaches. Huh? That poor liver. The poor liver. So I saw her and she had big humongous mercury fillings. And one of the things that I do is I have a voltmeter and I can take the voltmeter and measure. So mercury filling is an amalgam. So it's a mixture of three or four silver, tin, copper, mercury. And if you put mixed metals in a salt solution, you can get a current. That's mm. what a battery is. Yep, yep, you know, yep. In a car, you have a lead electrode and a and a zinc electrode, and the and the electrons flow, and you get a you get a current flow. So in your mouth, you can get a current flow from the filling. So if you put one electrode on the filling, and then you put a grounding electrode on the inside of the cheek, and you have a voltmeter, you can measure the current that's being produced from these things. And um, so she had the highest one I'd ever seen. The, the, the filling was producing 350 millivolts of current 24 oh. hours a day, going right in her jawbone and right into her head. Jeez. So I said, maybe this is what's wrong with you. And I sent her to the biological dentist. He took the filling out. He did that quadrant, but the big one was that one. And she said, by the time that she got from the operatory to the front desk, this pressure that she was living with was gone. Mm. Okay. And it cured her headaches. Wow. So she came back for recheck and she said, you know, I have another problem and it's my husband. And my husband, would you, would you see him? Because we got married and we went on a honeymoon and he had some dental work done. And within a week or two, he got a almost total body paralysis. He ended up in a wheelchair. Wow. He spends his whole day in a daycare facility because he can't take care of himself. And I'm wondering if he had bad dental work like I did. And now this is, she's been living with us for 25 years. So she brings him in here. And Wait, he's been like that for 25 years. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Because they had been married for 25 years. Oh my God. During the day she would go to work and he would be at this daycare facility to take care of him because he couldn't feed himself. He couldn't, he couldn't do hardly anything. And at night she would bring him home. And so I sent him to the dentist. And what the dentist found is that the doctor had pulled a tooth and in the cavity where the tooth was, he had put a bullet sized piece of amalgam. Oh my gosh. And it caused an acute poisoning of this guy, oh my which has pretty much wrecked his, his, his system. And the dentist took it out and we tried to detox him, but it was so long and the damage was so bad that we really, oh. we didn't get very far with him, but, oh. but another one sort of a, you know, like a, like a tragedy, like a massive tragedy of this poor guy. Mm, my gosh, that's, that's, that's scary. That's, yeah. that's really scary. You know, it's almost criminal. These conventional dentists and conventional doctors, what they're doing. And even to this day, I mean, when I make videos on mercury amalgams and the dangers of it, cavitations, et cetera, I've got these dentists that comments on my videos saying, oh, that's been disproven. They've looked at blood work and there's no mercury in the blood because of course, as you know, it's gone, it's in your tissues. That's right. more for acute poisoning. So, right. you know, they have their claims and there's still it's a lot of dentists that are putting these amalgam fillings in people's mouths. I mean, less and less, but they're still doing it. It's still legal. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, let's transition now to protein. Okay. You know, I didn't even expect to talk about that, but I'm so fascinated yeah. by it. It's just, it's so important. So hopefully that was valuable to the audience, you know, get, go find a good dentist, but protein. I mean, you're like the man when it comes to protein, you said something interesting. It's not that we have a protein deficiency is that we have, it's, it's actually an amino acid deficiency, but let me ask you this question. There's a theory out there and I want to hear your thoughts on this theory and we'll customize it to the amino acid part. The theory is that the reason we have this obesity epidemic, one of the major reasons is, is because we're not getting enough protein. And in order to seek that protein, 
we have to overeat. A lot of these boxed foods and processed foods are limited in protein. So you have to overeat to get that requirement of amino acids. So do you see that as one of the main causes towards obesity? We're overeating because we're not getting enough amino acids. And it's just what this the body's way of trying to get that number. It's probably includes amino acids, but it's probably also just there's so much tox. There's, the body is so inundated with so many biological toxins from the air, water, um, and food that I think this, the normal signaling method, uh, mechanisms in the body about satiety and mm. hunger and craving and is all off. Yeah, makes sense. And, you know, you see this. You, I know you guys do some stuff with fasting with people, but you get people on a fast for a couple of days and pretty soon you start to see the normal regulation come back in. And the, you know, and I think most people won't put up with that. They won't go hungry for 24 hours. You know? They just won't do it. But if they did, and it might take a few days, they will, you know, they start to like, like good stuff looks good and bad stuff looks bad like it's supposed to. Yeah. And um, so I think it's a it's that. And then, um, like we said earlier, most people's gut is, you know, like 100 percent. This is I can say this without any qualification. One hundred percent of every patient that we see in this clinic has a toxic gut. Hundred mm. percent. Leaky, leaky gut. They have a leaky gut. They have a toxic gut. They got organisms in there. Uh, with maldigestion and inflammation and you got to fix that and bad food makes that worse and you know what what happens is that the microbiome has a very big part in how we feel how we act what we crave what we want and if you feed the bad guy one so there's there's sort of two camps there's good guy ones and there's bad guy ones if you got too many bad guy ones they are sending you signals all the time of, I need a Big Mac. I've got to have a candy bar. I, you know, I've just eaten a 2000 calorie Thanksgiving dinner, but I have to have some candy or chocolate or ice cream or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the signals are all whacked out. Um, so, if you fix this in people, they, they, you know, they, they're, everything changes, you know, like apples taste sweet and, um, and bananas are like a treat, yeah. you know? especially if you've been keto. Yeah, seriously. It's like nature's candy. Yeah. This is, this is important because a lot of people who, who follow, who listen to the show and watch the show, they struggle with carb addiction, sugar addiction. And yeah, there's a lot of components to it, but a big part of it is what you just said, you know, the, the signals are crossed, leptin resistance, you have ghrelin off the charts, and but also the gut, you know, the gut is said the bad bacteria, it's kind of like that devil on one shoulder and then the angel on the other. You got the devil telling you too many things, you got to shut it up. So how do how do things like your product, you have a great product called Perfect Aminos that I use all the time. How was that formulated to be um, absorbable? How does that improve our digestion and, and also with these sugar cravings? So I think just as, as kind of a basic, so people get, you know, people think of protein. And I think that the, um, about 10 years ago, I got invited to be a keynote speaker at the American College of Nutrition. And I got it because I had a patient um, who was a member of that organization and she was on the committee to appoint speakers. And so she said, why don't you come and talk to these guys? And the meeting was in Miami and I went down there and there was like 400 people in a room. And these are either PhD dietitians or, you know, they were, they're, they're experts in food and food science. And I get, did a lecture on this topic of amino acids, but also on qual, what is a quality protein? Like how do you judge protein quality? Now, if you look in the standard dietetic cookbooks or in the start, uh, textbooks, what it says is that the best proteins are animal proteins, which is true. And the one that's at the top, top of the list is whey. Now, what I didn't know when I, when I accepted the invitation to the American College of Nutrition was that this, this group had been set up 
as kind of a front group for the whey protein industry. Mm. Interesting. So they funded it. They provided all the money for the research to show <laughs> that whey protein was 100% digestible and it mm. was blah, blah, blah. And so about a week before I went, a friend of mine who knew about this called me and he said, are you sure you want to go down there? <laughs> so I said, I'm ready for him. Okay. And none of the members know any of this stuff. You know, they just think they're in a group and they publish a journal and it's all fine. So what I told them is that if you measure protein quality, it's, it's fairly easily done. So if there's three macronutrients, so there's carbohydrates and fats and proteins, proteins differ from carbohydrates and fats in that proteins have nitrogen. So amino acid, amino in Greek means nitrogen. Mm. So these are nitrogen containing foods. They're basically carbs with nitrogen on them. And there's about 22 of them in nature that exist. And if you put these together in different building, in different sequences, it's almost like stringing beads. So you've got a, the bead manufacturer says, for this particular bead, we're going to do a red one, a yellow one, a blue one, and an orange one. And so in the cell, what happens is to make a protein, and there's a couple hundred thousand different proteins in the body. So proteins are skin and liver and heart, but it's also enzymes and immune cells and hair. These are all different proteins, digestive enzymes, that each one has a different sequence. And some proteins are super simple, like thyroid hormone is a single amino acid with some iodines on it. Insulin has, I think, 51 amino acids. Growth hormone, I think, has a couple hundred. Actin or myosin, the main muscle protein has close to 5,000 mm. amino acids in one wow. fiber. So you eat a steak or you have some eggs and through the proper digestion process, that long fiber, that long sequence of protein gets broken down into individual amino acids, which then get absorbed, then go into your bloodstream and then go to the cell. And then the cell, so assuming that you do digest it and you do absorb it, which is a big barrier for most people because their gut isn't any good and they don't have stomach acid and enzymes, but assuming that that was possible, the amino acids reach the cell and then the cell has to reassemble those amino acids into growth hormone or insulin or hair or liver or muscle or whatever it's going to do. Now, this is going on all the time, 24 hours a day. So you just worked out you did your maximum number of pull-ups and your muscles are sore and there's a little there's little micro tears in the muscle and they're injured and the and the muscle cell has to fix those little tears and so it's got to have the amino acids to do that mm -hmm. or if you're trying to build muscle to grow new muscle cells to do it and so in the muscle if those amino acids aren't there it can't do it because it says okay for for actin i need a tryptophan and a this and a that and a that and the, that isn't there, hmm. like it's not there. So when we do profiles of serum amino acids and we find, holy smokes, you got six out of eight essential amino acids that are in a very, very low range. That means your cells are gonna have a low range. That means when your cells are trying to repair you and recover you, they're not gonna do it. And it gets on hold. And maybe the next meal, there's enough coming through that it could do that. But if you've got 200,000 proteins that have to be sort of done every day and you're a busy person. So you need neurotransmitters, you're, you're trying to think and you need energy, your whole Krebs cycle. You need all these enzymes to do this and you gotta keep your bones going and your heart going and, and your liver detoxification. Most people are amino acid deficient and they're not getting the nutrition they need from their food. So now if we go back and we say, let's measure which foods provide the best source of amino acids for someone. And you can do a balance study. So in a protein, the percentage of nitrogen in a protein is about 16%. So if you had 100 grams of, let's say, whey protein, 16 of those grams is measurable nitrogen. 
So you do a study with some people and you say, okay, the only protein we're going to give you is whey protein. And you can have fruits and vegetables because there's negligible amounts of, of usable protein in fruits and vegetables and pastas and breads and things like that. It's negligible. Mm-hmm. So we're going to measure how much nitrogen we put in you. So let's say we're going to give you 100 grams of whey protein every day, 16 grams of nitrogen. And then we're going to collect urine and stool and measure how much came out. Now, in amino acid metabolism, when the amino acid enters the cell, it can go either what we call anabolic pathway, which means it gets made into a protein, or it can go into a catabolic, so breakdown pathway, which means the body takes the nitrogen off, has a carb now, and it can use the carb for fuel or it can store it as fat or it can store it as glycogen. And the percentage of which way it goes determines that what you want from your proteins is that they go down this anabolic nitrogen pathway and they get incorporated into body protein. So you can do a balance study of how much came in, how much came out. The what comes out tells you how little was used or how much was used. So if you take whey protein and you do this study, what you find is only about 16% of the amino acids that are extracted by the body when you eat whey protein are utilized. Mm. 84% becomes a carb. It's calories. If you wanted it as a protein source, you could eat enough if your digestion could handle it to do it, but it's very inefficient. One tier up is the meat, meat and fish. They're better. They're about 33% utilized, net nitrogen utilized. Okay. And then eggs are the next tier up. So whole chicken eggs, yolk plus white is 48% utilized. If you just eat the white part, you know, some people have a phobia about, about yolk and cholesterol and all this stuff, but in the yolk is an essential amino acid where most of the essential amino acid is, which is, which is methionine. And if you just eat the white, the white takes you back down to 16. So egg whites are about as good as whey. Mm. They're not very good. Okay. Now above whey, above um, eggs, eggs yeah. are breast milk. Mm, interesting. What's so that? 49. 49? Yeah. It's hard to get. What about goat milk? Isn't goat milk similar structure? No, it's, it's dairy. It's, ah. it's 16. Okay. All the dairies are the same. Now, perfect amino is 99. So when you take perfect amino, 99% of the amino acids go into making protein by your body. And so a good thing to do is to add amino acids. I don't care who you are, that we suggest most people take 10 grams a day, take them all at once, that, and if you're very busy or you're working out hard, or you just had surgery, or you're you're nursing a baby, or you've got higher protein needs, then you take more. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's very, um, so it's very efficient. And then, so there's thousands and thousands of athletes who are write testimonials in about how it changed them, how they recover faster, how they feel better. And like I said earlier, when I was working with this, with the tour team, they just couldn't believe it. Like they just couldn't believe how, what, what, what an impact it had. And what I tell the guys that I see is if, you know, if, if you aren't taking perfect amino, the guys who are beating you are. (laughs) <laughs> That's good. That'll, that'll convince them. So, okay, let me, I want to get, I want to understand this really well. And then I want to know what the reaction was from that audience when you explain this. But first question is this. So you mentioned, for example, whey protein, about 16% of it is actually utilized. Uh, 84% of it uh, goes down the pathway of ca- cannibalism is oh, ca- yeah, catabolic. catabolic. Yeah. Catabolic. Which means breakdown. Breakdown. Um, I also know that whey protein is very insulinogenic. So what's the relationship there between the insulin spiking and the whey protein? Because it, tr- it turns into a carb. So it's the carb so that it turns into, which raises, which causes insulin. Which then spikes spike. insulin because insulin it. is responsive to carb. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. And then the other pathway is anabolic, but yeah. is that anabolic separate than uh, an mTOR or me- me- uh, mechanistic targeted rapamycin? Is that a separate anabolic pathway you're referring to? 
Well, so mTOR is a is a gene which, when triggered, produces it starts protein synthesis. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if so. Insulin spikes mTOR. Mm-hmm. Food spikes mTOR. Leucine spikes mTOR. Um, to try to figure out what spikes in mTOR is is not something that you can just order from a laboratory. So we don't find, and so we're, I'm very sensitive to mTOR because all the people who have cancer have mTOR turned way up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We don't find that we find that. So these, these, most of these cancer patients are, they've been very catabolic for a long time. They've lost weight. They've lost muscle. They're depleted. Their immune systems are in bad shape and we give them large doses of perfect amino. And we do not find that they get, that it stimulates the cancer in any way to grow. It's not, it's, it, you know, in people who are trying to get their mTOR stimulated to, you know, to get healthier, it seems to work in cancer patients. There doesn't seem to be any downside. Interesting. Yeah. So if you ate a piece of steak, you'd get an mTOR spike, but which if you do that in excess could be problematic when it's too much mTOR. But if you're taking amino, perfect aminos, there's an mTOR effect, but not in a negative um, prolonged state. Is that what you're saying? I want to get that. So here's the thing, mTOR is really important because if, if you're if you're going to maintain your body mass, yeah, totally. So if you if you you want mTOR to be on, and then you want to have periods where your mTOR is off. So if you're doing intermittent fasting or time restricted eating, you're when you're not there, and you want and you want your insulin to go down, then mTOR is going to be off, and when you when you eat and you want to grow and you want to recover, then you want your mTOR on. Mm -hmm. Now we did an experiment where we gave people, um, they had an empty stomach and we gave people perfect amino and we measured their levels of glucose and insulin 30, 60 and 90 minutes after they ate. And we didn't see any glucose spike and we didn't see any insulin spike. Mm. So I'm not sure what it's doing with mTOR. I'm not yeah, it's sure. fascinating. Yeah, because typically, you know, mTOR, if mTOR goes up, autophagy goes down in general. But in this case, it, it sounds like it might not be happening. So, okay, I got that. And then what did the, when that conference you spoke at, 400 people here in Miami. So, what, so what happened was, is when I finished the lecture, there was dead silence for about three minutes. <laughs> and I looked over to the this patient of mine who was in the front row. And I said, did I just really step in it? And she said, no, just wait. And then the questions started to come. Like, why didn't we learn this? How come we didn't know any of this stuff? And the next speaker was supposed to go on. I was supposed to have 10 minutes for questions. And the next speaker was supposed to come on at 10 minutes. And the next speaker was delayed for 35 more minutes because they were just clamoring for like, what is this? Why don't we know this? Blah, blah, blah. It was really, it was amazing. You know, I wasn't sure if I was going to get, they were going to throw tomatoes at me yeah. or whether it was going to be okay, but it ended up, it was, it was fantastic. That's cool. And, I'm uh, glad they were receptive to it as well. That's awesome. How long ago was that? Probably 10 years ago, maybe wow. 12 years ago. Yeah. The other now, thing I noticed from the book, so the book has sold th- tens of thousands of copies and not one per, I haven't gotten one, you're full of crap. This is wrong. Like not one. And I, I mean, that's surprising for you. You, you could say that it, that it's a nice day and you could get people and it's a it's beautiful, true. sunny day, it's 75 degrees. And you would get some people who would say, no, it's not. So true. So, so to me, this was just like, this is like, like that's amazing. Awesome. Yeah, that is. And the book, by the way, it's called the search for the perfect protein, the key to solving weight loss, depression, fatigue, insomnia, and osteoporosis. Do you have a, a few more minutes to I have a couple more questions or do you have a yeah. hard stop? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, your product is Perfect Aminos, and uh, I take ten, 10 capsules a day, which is 10 grams, yep. right? Um, I also, my mom doesn't like taking supplements, so I love that you have the bars. You have protein bars as well with the amino uh, uh, bars. So my mom takes that. You also have electrolyte blends, and so there's a lot of availability, and we're going to drop a link for everybody down below with the coupon code to check it out. But um, I have a question regarding uh, contraindication. So in my notes here, uh, I see that there are no contraindications to taking perfect aminos. Is that right? 
Right. There's, there has not been any kind of interaction with any medication. Um, of course, individuals, if they're in a, you know, their, their doctor is very unlikely to have any information on amino acids or know anything about it. So as a sort of a CYA, I would say, of course, talk to your doctor. Yeah. What I can tell you from experience and then that, you know, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of bottles of this product have been sold that there's never been any major reaction, any major allergy. Um, it's the, the, it doesn't seem to interact with any medications either. So I think it's very safe. It's nutrition. These aren't drugs. This is nutrition. Yeah. And that, um, especially people who have gut problems or who are malnourished, if they add perfect amino, you will see them start to, i I had a patient in here a couple of years ago who was, um, she is a breast cancer patient and she had been diagnosed with breast cancer at like six months of pregnancy. Wow. And so she was not a candidate for any kind of normal chemotherapy or anything. Um, her beliefs were that she would not abort this baby. And so by the time she ended the pregnancy and she had a healthy baby, she, the breast cancer had gone all over the place. Mm. And when she came in here, um, she had wasted down to like 90 pounds and her hemoglobin was like five. I could, you know, and I actually, when I got the thing back and she was in here, I was, you know, I was going to send her to the emergency room to get a blood transfusion. And she said, no, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I can't take a blood transfusion. Mm. So, okay. So we started loading her up with perfect amino. And in about three months, her hemoglobin went up to 11 or 12. She was wow. able to do our treatments. Like you can grow stuff back. Mm. And it's very impressive as to, you know, the power of these things where, you know, um, and if the, the biggest risk group on protein malnourished are vegetarians and vegans. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because the protein quality in vegetable proteins is very low. The, the net nitrogen utilization is very low. We did an experiment with spirulinas, took 24 different spirulinas. Now, if you go in the health food store and you'll see the advertising spirulinas, you know, the spirulina is what the, what the whales eat. And, and you can grow up 2000 or 5,000. I don't know how much whales weigh whale by just eating these, these spirulina algae. But for humans, they're not the ideal food. And so out of 24 species that were tested, 18 of them were missing essential amino acids and they weren't hardly any good at all. Mm. And six of them had a net nitrogen utilization of only six. Mm. So whey and soy are like 16, 17. These, this is not a good food for humans. It doesn't mean that the chlorophyll isn't good for you. It is. Right. You're just there's saying it's hard. Hard. That are good. There's good stuff in there, carotenoids. There's all kinds of good stuff in there, but as a protein source, it isn't very good. The other one that's now it's a multi-billion dollar industry is the collagen industry. Yeah. Collagen, yeah. you need eight essential amino acids to build a protein and collagen is missing one. Tryptophan mm -hmm. is missing. Yeah, it's not complete. Yep. So if you want to build, if you want to be anabolic, you want to build your body up, um, there just isn't anything close to perfect amino to do that. And it's, um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't eat whey protein. They're not like poisonous bad foods. But um, if you want to get the most for your for for your investment in supplements or food, this is there's there's there just isn't anything like it. What's the difference between perfect aminos and uh, branched chain amino acids? So there are eight essential amino acids. So there, the our bodies use about 22 different ones. Debate. Some people say 20, 22. It doesn't matter. But eight of them you got to have. They got to be in the food. And from the eight, the body can make the other 14. So if, if you look uh, in the textbooks, it says, no, there's really nine essential amino acids. And if you're a baby or you're real old, there's 10 amino acids. But it really isn't true. If you have the blend that's in perfect amino, and we did this study too, give perfect amino, measure the baseline levels of the two other amino acids that are sometimes said to be essential. It's arginine and histidine. If you measure blood levels, so you, you measure amino acid levels in the blood, you give someone 10 grams of perfect amino, and then you measure blood levels at 30, 60, and 90 minutes, the histidine levels go up and the arginine mm. levels go up. The body makes the stuff. So they aren't really essential. Yeah. Um, 
And so they, uh, the stuff just really works. It's just, a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing product. Yeah, I love it. And there's so much we could talk about. We'll do a round two, but you, you know, you, I have in my notes, it helps with detoxification. You said it could help detox 30% faster. It helps prevent osteoporosis, osteopenia. So there's so many benefits to it. Go get it. We'll drop a link down below. Where do you want my audience to go check you out, doc? So I have two things mainly that I do. Uh, I have a clinic, which is mostly people with chronic unsolved illness, a lot of cancer, Lyme, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, autoimmune disease, and that's lifeworkswellnesscenter.com, L-I-F-E-W-O-R-K-S, wellnesscenter.com. Um, you can see us there. There's hundreds of videos on there and lots of information if people are seeking help in that area. Um, we have a big clinic with probably the best collection of different treatment modalities of any place in the country. I've got 72 staff, um, wow. three MDs, four nurse practitioners. And, and so I've just, I've just collected modalities to help people get well. Awesome. Um, I also have this product company, which is called body health. So we make perfect amino and about 25 other kinds of supplements. Um, they're really good. We're based here in Clearwater, Florida. Um, and there's also on there, there's lots of videos about all kinds of stuff. And I do a newsletter, uh, once a week, um, from one from body health and one from LifeWorks wellness center. It's a free subscription. Um, we have a lot of people who like it. And so you could subscribe free and kind of see what I'm thinking about and, and different ways to, uh, like help your health and improve your longevity. I love it. We'll put that down below. We'll do round two in person. I'll drive up to Clearwater. We'll do from your, you'll do it from your clinic. <laughs> Sounds I, good. I appreciate you, Doc. Thank you so much for an incredible conversation. And uh, you're doing amazing work. So congratulations and keep up the good job that you're doing. Thank you, Ben. Very enjoyable.